young guys take care of business. See, the older ones, they knew they got more mellow. Even these crusty religious guys, they got more mellow because you just live a while, you realize, look, you know what? We all mess up. And it's easier to forgive when you realize we all belong to a category of one. We're all wounders. We're all sinners. We're all herders. And the degree may vary, but it's in degree, not kind. Another thing that helps fuel forgiveness is compassion. Be kind and compassionate to one another. That word compassionate is a fascinating word. It literally means to get in someone else's shoes so that you can feel what they feel. You know, what's the old phrase? You know, don't judge me until you've walked a mile. How's that go? My moccasins or whatever. <laughs> and this word compassion literally means put yourself in someone else's place so you can see it the way they see it and you can feel what they must be feeling. It is amazing what happens when you truly put yourself in someone else's place to see it from their perspective and how they must be feeling because it changes the way you interpret and feel about their acts. Stephen Covey, in an outstanding book called The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, talks about a day he had a paradigm shift. He was riding a subway train in, I think it was New York City, in a city on the East Coast. He's riding the subway. He's heading on his way to work. He's got a long ride. And this guy comes off in with two young children. The guy pops down, the children pop down, and Covey's reading his paper. The kids start going absolutely haywire. They're running around, they're yelling off the car, down the car, you know, and whatnot. Everybody else is, you know, you know, see, everybody else is giving the eye roll, and then the head shake. All the things we do in good society to communicate to dad, corral your kids, buddy, this is really irritating. <laughs> Come on. And you know, I said at one point, you know, the kids run by and they bump up against his leg, you know, and. And, and the other time they kind of smashed the paper he was reading. And he's like doing everything he can to, you know, Pat, clue in, dude. Your kids are crazy. Nothing. Finally, Cubby's happy. He folds his paper and he looks. He says, uh, sir, maybe you should do something about your children. And it's like the guy kind of, oh, oh, he goes, man, I'm sorry. You're right. I... He said, I don't know what to do. We're just coming back from the hospital. My wife and the mother died, and I have no idea what to do. Oh, oh, oh. Change perspective. Make things look a little different. I thought you were a jerk. and said you're an unbelievable pain. And when we practice compassion, when we can somehow try to put ourselves in someone else's situation to see what they see and to feel what they feel. Listen, their wounds, their sins, their wrong acts don't become excusable, but they become understandable. Most of the time that we do things to hurt other people, we do it in a context that somehow compelled us to do things that we knew were wrong and we did it anyway. When I was growing up, my best friend was a dog. It's the only being that would like me. <laughs> and my dog and I, we went everywhere together. Corky was my dog thing, kind of a cocker spaniel mix. We were inseparable for like 10 years. One day, I'm, I, oh, I was fifth or sixth grade, probably at the time. I hopped in the car with my mom. We were driving into town that I don't even know what we were going to do. But as we're driving down the road, Kirky was chasing us and went out in front of the car and we hit her. World shattered, right? I had the car door open and jumped out before my mother came to a, star, a stop. I ran back to where Corky was in the ditch. And I ran up to her and I just put my hands on her head and she bit me. <laughs> my only friend bit me. Didn't face me a bit. Because you know what I knew? She's in pain. And she's hurting. And that pain has driven her to just do that. And we ended up, you know, being able to get her in the car and take her to a vet. It was a process, but she actually survived and 
and lived a few more years. It was, it was great, but it's like I, I could deal with the action because I understood that it was driven by something. So often, if we'll just try to put ourselves in other people's shoes, the, the sin doesn't become excusable, but it's understandable. We get it. We understand a little more the context of why it might have been easier to make that choice and it makes it easier to forgive. And then here's the, the last thing, the last thing for today, experience. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ. God forgave you. See, it turns out it's a whole lot easier to forgive people for their crimes when we've experienced what it's like for God to forgive us for our crimes. My story? <coughs> I became a follower of Jesus when I was in high school. And I had managed at a very young age to pile up a pretty impressive list of transgressions. Most of which, by, my, by the way, my parents still do not know. <laughs> Edit that out of the tape, please. <laughs> One Sunday evening, God invaded my life. And in a very undeserved way, he set me free from the punishment that I absolutely deserved and restored me to a place where I could actually have somewhat of a, of a normal life. And I'm going to be honest with you. That has so overwhelmed me that it's changed the fabric of my life. I know what it's like to deserve the judgment of God. I know what it's like to be utterly guilty without excuse before God and deserve the ultimate punishment, deserve to be separated from God for all eternity in the lake of fire. Deserved it. And yet God, forgave me. And one of the things that's done is it's made it a little easier for me to look at others and forgive them. Because I swim in the ocean of forgiveness. Hey, two questions. One, are you swimming in an ocean of forgiveness? Because you've had a transaction with God where he's just forgiven you fully and freely because you placed your faith in his son as your only hope. Second question. Who do you need to forgive? It's the first step to being a relational genius. Father, thanks for the opportunity to be together this morning and I'm First of all, I'm grateful that you are a forgiving God. And there is no one, not me, with all I have done, not anyone on the planet, that you will not forgive utterly, completely, and eternally if he or she will simply put their hope in you. And I'm asking if anyone has it, that maybe even in the quietness and holiness of this moment, they might just commit themselves to Christ. That they might put all their hope in him and his death on the cross to atone for all of their sins and just ask you for the forgiveness you freely give. And then God, I pray you'll help us to be forgiving people. May we this week practice this skill and begin to unlock the relational genius within. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Hey, thanks so much for being here on this Easter Sunday. I hope you have an awesome day, and hopefully we'll see you next week.